my name is Marianne Rockwell. I'm a librarian at Saratoga Springs Public Library, and this is Poets Talk Poetry, in which I invite a poet to read and discuss two poems, one poem by another poet and then one of their own poems. Today, I'm very pleased to present Dr. Sarah Giragosian, who is a full-time lecturer in writing and critical inquiry and affiliated faculty member in English at University of Albany, SUNY. She's also the author of the poetry collections Queer Fish, which was the winner of the American Poetry Journal Prize, Book Prize of 2017 and The Death Spiral, uh, put out by Black Lawrence Press in 2020. Sarah is also the co-editor with Virginia Konken of Marbles on the Floor, How to Assemble a Book of Poems by University of Akron Press, which is forthcoming. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you so much. I'm so delighted to be here. Great, glad to have you here. So you're going to read, um, to start by um, reading Natasha Trethewey's poem, Incident. And can you tell me a little about why you chose this poem to read? Absolutely. Um, I'm just so impressed by the artistry of Natasha Trethewey. I just taught her book, um, Native Guard, to my students, and this poem continues to haunt me. Um, it's quite an understated poem. Um, there's use of understatement and withheld imagery, um, and it explores racial trauma. Um, when in the 60s, when Trethaway was living in Mississippi as a child, um, the Klan came to her yard and, and burned a cross, and this poem um, explores that memory. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to hear that from hear you read it now. Looking forward to that. Okay, so incident. We tell the story every year, how we peered from the windows, shades drawn, though nothing really happened, the charred grass now green again. We peered from the windows, shade drawn, at the cross trussed like a Christmas tree, the charred grass still green. Then we darkened our rooms, lit the hurricane lamps. At the cross trussed like a Christmas tree, a few men gathered, white as angels in their gowns. We darkened our room and lit hurricane lamps, the wicks trembling in their fonts of oil. It seemed the angels had gathered, white men in their gowns. When they were done, they left quietly. No one came. The wicks trembled all night in their fonts of oil. By morning, the flames had dimmed. When they were done, the men left quietly. No one came. Nothing really happened. By morning, all the flames had dimmed. We tell the story every year. Wow. That is just such a powerful poem. It is, and so subtle. I mean, this is a pantoum, um, which is a Malaysian form from the, the 15th century based on repetition. Um, so uh, this poem has, um, a series of quatrains and the second and fourth lines of each stanza are repeated as the first and third lines of the next, with the exception of the last stanza. Um, but what you will notice in this poem is that there are, there's repetition with a difference, right? There's some variation within the repetition, mm -hmm. um, you know, kind of conjuring the, 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 the notion of a story, a family story that's been told over the years that might has might have had slight changes or slight emendations. Mm -hmm. And something about that repetition underscores the, the sense of trauma, like it's something that the, the person who re has this memory can't quite shake ever. Absolutely, right. And, you know, there's a sense that this is, this is a child's point of view, um, given, you know, the understatement, um, the attempt to understand the magnitude and, and um, the gravity of the situation, you know. So there are lines like, it seemed the angels had gathered white men in their gowns. Well, that's the point of view of a, a child, right? Um, and this um, scene to her looks much like a, a Christmas scene, right? And I think it's that 
um, that dissonance, mm -hmm. uh, that failure to, to really understand what, what's happening that um, is part of what makes this poem so haunting, so disturbing. Mm -hmm. um, and it also ends up making uh, white and the white people in their white gowns something absolutely terrifying. Absolutely. These angels are become horrific. Absolutely. And, and yet um, there's such restraint on Natasha Trethewey's part. I think, um, you know, what, what I, strikes me as interesting is that the verbs are so neutral, right? So when they were done, they left quietly. No one came. Um, it seemed the angels had gathered, right? So um, absolutely a harrowing poem, but there, there is this kind of restraint um, or kind of withholding, right? Um, again, as if the child, um, you know, is, is grappling uh, to understand or, or, or fails to understand and also relies perhaps on the stories that her parents told her. Um, there's a sense that the parents have kind of um, censored or, you know, withheld some information from her. Um, nothing really happened, for example, mm -hmm. is one of those lines. Right. Um, nothing really happened at the end. Um, it, there's no evidence. The, it, probably these men were never charged with anything. Um, so there's no evidence. There's no history. Um, there's no documentation of this history of this event. Um, but she knows it did happen, in fact. Right. Um, I was really struck by a few um, images that came up that uh, lit the hurricane lamps um, because th that sense of turmoil, it kind of underscores just with that, the word hurricane. Mm -hmm. And also uh, the wicks trembling. So the, the wicks of the hurricane lamps trembling in their fonts of oil. And I thought of a baptismal font, you know, I thought of this, as you pointed out, this is a child's point of view and um, such a kind of a t taking away of innocence. Mm -hmm. So Absolutely, yeah. I mean, um, if I can, I'd like to go back to something you said earlier about um, a kind of forgotten history or a history that hasn't, um, you know, um, been addressed in kind of the, the, the main archives or the mainstream history. Um, and that's, I think, a major um, trope that Trethaway works with in her collection, Native Guard. Um, so Native Guard actually is um, referring to a, a, a group of soldiers who worked at a fort that held captive um, Confederate soldiers. Um, Trethaway grew up in that town in Gulfport, Mississippi. Um, but it wasn't until she was an adult that she began to uncover that history of, of these soldiers. Um, each, uh, each section of that collection in some way seems to address trauma and um, lost history. And in some ways, I think that her collection is an attempt to resurrect these hidden histories. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And um, you also address the, the hurricane lamps and, um, you know, and the trembling wicks. Yeah, the fonts of oil. Um, that's really interesting, you know, the ways in which um, there, you know, there are uh, emblems of danger, right? There are images of precarity. Um, and yet at the same time, that's in tension with, um, you know, the, the very understated kind of relaxed style of the poem, um, which I think is, is really powerful. Um, and I'm always just so impressed by, um, you know, her, uh, her craftsmanship um, the ways in which this poem is really quite musical, um, not just in its repetition, but also in the repetition of certain sounds like um, the consonantal rhymes and charred grass and cross trust, right? A lot of um, really textured language in this poem. Definitely. I noticed that too. Um... And, and I think, you know, you mentioned how she's 
addressing a history that has that is not in the archives, whatever archives they may be. Mm-hmm. And, and that's kind of the job of poetry. It ends up being the job of poetry in some ways to address the things that were not spoken of um, so much. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that sense of a kind of recovery project um, is really embedded in her work. Mm-hmm. Um, I just finished reading her memoir, Memorial Drive, and, um, and it's an account of um, her own personal history, um, you know, she grew up with a, a biracial uh, family, um, a father who um, was white and a, a mother who was a, a woman of color um, in the South, right? So um, she saw that kind of racial discrimination firsthand, but also um, later in her life at the age of 19, she witnessed um, her stepfather different father, um, murder her mother. Um, so she had, um, and in some ways, uh, I think there was a tremendous amount of guilt. Um, so this, this memoir is really, um, well, again, it's beautifully crafted as is the case with her writing, but it's also really harrowing. Um, but it's an attempt to uh, to reconcile herself to this history that um, you know her own personal history that she had submerged in, in many ways throughout her adulthood years in order to cope. Mm. Yeah. Well, thanks for reminding me about her work because I need to ex- for myself explore it further. And thank you so much for reading that and Absolutely. discussing it with me. And now you're going to read. Um, your poem that was published in Permafrost magazine. Wow. Sure. So, um, yeah, this is this is a poem I wrote a while ago. It's um, in my book Queer Fish, and um, it also contends with racial trauma. Um, I grew up with my cousins who are biracial, and um, you know, I, I as a very young person. I wasn't aware of my white privilege. Um, It only came, uh, it only uh, made sense to me later, you know, when I I began, my cousins began to to contend with uh, racial slights that they encountered in school. Um, So this is a poem that I dedicated for my cousin, uh, Jesse. It's called, If I Were Your Sister and You Were a Bird and All the Wolves Were Buried and Dead. Color me blue and red, I said, and you filled in my face purple, your paint spilling over the lines. An only child, no more, I took to the flung togetherness of our lives. The way my comebacks bled into your repartee, the winter days I'd find your mitten coupled with mine, the new territories of care and fury between us, more sisters than cousins. You, the polo to my Marco, the blind man to my buff, bluff. If you hid, I would follow. All day, we would back float angels into the first snowfall. And when I blended in, you called me white as snow. But our mothers couldn't miss us. Each morning, mine or yours would grab one of us and tug a pick through your baby Afro or my baby knots before we struck out for school sidling into seats at the back of the bus. But the phrase meant nothing to us then, but a spot away from prying eyes. It was not a command or the state of the race. Besides, I was a zebra fish or something very much like it. And you were a catbird. And we didn't know anything about the need to call ourselves one thing or another. But maybe the bluff was yours. And all that time between playing pranks and dress up making dares and taking them. You knew that wolves, real ones, stalk the city blocks. And while I could blend in, you cut your teeth when one caught sight of your skin and I blindly walked on to a different street. Another powerful poem, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you. So it also addresses race as you pointed out and um, it, to me, I, I find it questioning the construct 
of race and identity in in so many ways in a really beautiful in the way that poetry does right so um color me blue and red i said and then you, uh you filled in my face purple paint spilling over the line that's just so beautiful what a great start to the poem Thank you so much. Yeah, I, I really wanted to try to um, put myself in the perspective of my younger self, right, who, um, you know, was flirting with identity, but identity for me at a young age as a child really um, meant, play, you know, playing with identity, um, playing with, with color and um, imagining myself as uh, different animals you know, hybrid creatures. I, I wanted to explore the idea that, um, you know, as a, a child, there was a kind of beauty in that um, innocence. Mm -hmm. But then of course, you know, um, as I grew up and attended the same school as my cousin and had, you know, an experience based on my own identity as a white person that jarred very much with her experience as a, a um, a child, uh, African American child, um, you know, I, I became more cognizant of the fact that I was being granted privileges that she wasn't afforded, um, and so yeah, this poem is anticipating that that period. So you really watch yourself evolve into consciousness in that way, um, having um, a, an African American cousin. And, and being close as children and then kind of going, there's a sense of divergence. And part of that is the opportunity that you were afforded and she was not so much. Right, right. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, children have a strong sense of, of justice. And, um, you know, I, I tried in this poem to show, um, you know, the, the, both the innocence, but also the coming into consciousness of the fact that there, there was um, injustice and that she grew up, um, you know, with uh, antagonizing children. Um, and, um, you know, that was, that was her um, experience of cutting her, her teeth on racial slights. And, and the same for me when I became aware of the fact that she was being treated differently than I was. Mm -hmm. and, the, and then you, so at the end, which is where that line comes in, you cut your teeth um, when one caught sight of your skin and I, blind as a babe in the woods, walked on to a different street. So those verbs you're using are so different. Um, one is um, imbued with violence and walked is just uh, sauntered, sauntered onto another street. It might as well be, right? It's just uh, no effort whatsoever. Well, not, that's not true, but I mean, the implication is a sense of effortlessness or um, ease. Right, mm -hmm. absolutely. And I think there's, um you know, in the retrospective narration of this um, experience, I think, you know, there are ways in which the poem is subtly grappling with, with grief over that, um, but also acknowledging the fact that, um, you know, as a, as a child, it was, I, I was very blind um, and, and that insulated me in many ways. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I also wanted to capture the sense of, of whimsy of childhood, right? Too. You really did. I feel that you really did. I, I mean, I so identified with it. Um, all day we would back float angels into the first snowfall. That's such a beautiful enjambment. Um, and when I blended in, you called me white as snow. And so there, so there's a sense of camouflage kind of blending in, not standing out there too. Um, so it's kind of, there's a nice melding of the kind of joy and innocence of childhood and then the kind of the uh, underlying struggle, you know, um, it's great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and the hybrid, I like that I was zebra fish or something very much like it. And you were, 
a catbird, so two hybrid creatures. And we didn't know anything about the need to call ourselves one thing or another, to identify as something, you know? Um, it's really beautiful. Yeah, I mean, of course, all of our identities are complicated, right? Um, right. And they're not re reducible to a monolithic identity. And I, I wanted to explore the fact that, um, you know, um, it was in animals. Uh, animals were kind of my resource and my source of resilience as, as a kid, um, imagining different animals, having pets, um, imagining myself into uh, the identity of an animal. Mm -hmm. So that's a part of it as well. Yeah. Well, it's really beautiful and it goes so well. It pairs well with the Natasha Trethewey's poem, Incident. And Thank you. I, I, I learned so much though from Trethewey in terms of, you know, relaxing my style, um, using understatement. Um, I, I'm just, I'm so impressed by, by Trethewey's work and um, her formalism as well. Um, you know, yes, I, I read her poem, I think it's Miscegenation. If I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but I think that's also informal. It's either a pantoum or some formal. Mm -hmm form. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, it, she's, she's uh, one of those poets who I think um, sometimes uses form to highlight the strangeness of it, right? Like mm. uh, using uh, not the, the pantheum in the strictest sense, but introducing some variation. Um, to me, that that's, you know, it, it provides energy. It, it, um, you know, it gestures to the sense of um, surprise and improvisation, which is what happens when we tell stories over a long period of time. Um, but it, again, it's just, it's done with such a light hand, uh, with such a delicate touch. And I really, really admire that. Mm -hmm. Well, it's just been a pleasure talking to you about Trethewey's poem and about your poem and meeting you. And so thank you so much for being my guest today on Poets Talk Poetry. Thank you so much. It's been my pleasure. Very good. Have a Thank great day. You. Thank you, you too. Bye. Bye.